Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Water City Rock Talk. You get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button and notification bell, and that way you get notified when you have these great interviews. When we have these great interviews, today I've got from somewhere in Georgian Bay, I'll ask and confirm, I've got Tom Cochran of Tom yeah. Cochran and Red Rider and Tom Cochran, the Life is a Highway star. Let's go with that. How are you doing, Tom? I'm doing great, Ernest. Yeah. Currently, I'm out in Kelowna, but yeah, I uh, make a lot of music on my, in my uh, cabin on the show. Right, shows right. I, I was looking um, over your shoulder because you were talking about over my shoulder, and I was thinking, if you're in Georgian Bay, I mean, I never knew they had apartment complexes in Georgian Bay. So you're you're on the uh, West Coast today. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, I'm in Kelowna. This isn't an apartment, but it's... Uh, it, it has a lofty feel about it. There's mountains okay. in the background, and we're up. I'm up pretty high here, and I'm overlooking the Okanagan. And it's uh, it's a great spot. I've always uh, loved it out here, and um, so I'm out here quite a bit. But I kind of split my time between back east as well. Right on. So, um, just for the viewers here, um, they're obviously aware of you. Um, like I said, um, I, I first found out about you uh, back in the day when I heard Lunatic French. Just one of the favorite songs uh, I grew up to. And then you um, got a little bit more commercial with um, uh, Mad Mad World and, um, you know, Life is a Highway really broke you out internationally. Are you currently doing any writing right now, uh, Tom? Any chance of a new album coming out to um, um, come after the 2015 release? Yeah, I mean, it's about time. Uh, I've always got songs per percolating and it's, uh, you know, it's uh, I call them sketches when I'm working on them. So I yeah. kind of use a artist painter's reference to them but I, I um yeah i'm working on songs and i'd like to get down to it next year you know with uh utilizing the efforts of billy bell my good buddy and cohort in crime who plays guitar on my right side and then uh john webster who also is on the west coast is in vancouver so john john was very very instrumental and very involved in mad mad world and uh, one of my dearest friends. So, yeah, it's time to make some new, new music, get some of these songs uh, finalized. Right on. So, and and you have a, just a little bit of um, a history lesson for some people that aren't aware. You're very, uh, well, obviously you've got the, um, um, the, the honor, how am I going to say this without having to edit, um, distinction of um, the Office of Manitoba and the Order of the Office of uh, Canada. Um, and a lot of that is attributed, I believe, to your um, humanitarian work. What got you into doing that? Because people don't have to um, do humanitarian work and they don't have to um, go out and uh, volunteer, especially when there's as successful as you. What what brings you to that kind of a passion, Tom? Yeah, it's the Order of Manitoba and, and, and uh, I'm an officer in the Order of Canada. I, I think that um, I've always... I, you know, lately I've talked about music as, as, you know, I'm an audio sonic therapist because really as a songwriter, that's what you do. You know, you, you make people feel things, you make, mm -hmm. make them feel better about life. You make them feel better about themselves. You just perhaps get them out of their, um, you know, uh, headspace for a while. And, and, and music is, is really important for that. It's an important elixir. Um, and more and more the, the psychologists research it, they realize how important uh, of a therapy music is but i you know i've always thought of myself as a journalist i was going to be a journalist oh, wow. and um, so i call myself i used to call myself a sonic journalist a lot and i think at its best you're writing songs that um, that tell about tell stories tell about experiences tell about the world talk about the world reflect on the world um and i always had a passion for that i i grew up I was a strange kid. Some of my idols were uh, uh, Schlesinger and Edward R. Murrow and some of the great war correspondents because I always felt there was nothing more noble than putting your ass on the line. Yeah. Uh, to go to some of these troubled countries and and uh, uh, in war zones and tell people what the truth is. Um, that seems to have got a little convoluted in this day and age. And but you know, I do believe there is truth and and it, and it's you know, in good journalism at its best, um, doesn't take sides and it's non-bias and it just, right. this, this yeah. is what's going on. This is, this is through the lens of what we are seeing. And I was, I was always fascinated with, with what was going on in the world. So 
when we did Tears Are Not Enough and that horrible situation in Ethiopia became this cause celebre and everybody was aware of it. And there was a big fund, live aid and a big fundraiser. And we did Tears Are Not Enough. And in America, they did We Are the World and that. I, I thought, well, look at all of us here. You know, we're all pretty privileged. Uh, you know, music at that point would tended to be a very self-serving a thing you know where we're always struggling and working hard to get ahead which is all good stuff i believe in free enterprise but um but i thought you know we're all going to walk away from this and perhaps forget about it you know right. after a few weeks or a month and i i i looked into it and, and discovered that you know world vision who i've worked with for you know a couple of a few decades now um you know, I felt they were doing some really, really great work. And there's there's a number of organizations out there. But at that time, uh, late 80s or 86, 87, I felt that, um, yeah, the, the better part of the, the dollar was going to where it was supposed to go with, with that organization. I liked their, their values. I liked, um, they seemed to be extremely effective in whatever countries they went into. And I went on this long, protracted trip. With Terry David Mulligan, of all people, who I, right. I love. And I was paying playing the sketches for Mad Men World back then, but I hadn't written Life's a Highway yet. Yeah. And, he, and he was excited about the songs I was playing him on the trip. But we went to a lot of but war-tone Mo Mozambique. I was shot at in Mozambique. First time I ever saw somebody die in front of me, and it was wow. it was it was horrid. Um, so it left a lot of scars on my psyche, and I came home. Uh, I, you know, I digress here a little bit, but I came home and then I was pretty depressed about it, you know, a little post-trauma stress, you know, disorder and all that. And I got up one, one morning and I went out to my studio and I'd been working on this sketch called Love is a Highway. And my, my buddy, John Webster, who was co-producing the stuff with me, uh, the demos any, at any rate, uh, said, you got to finish that song. You got to finish that song. And I said, yeah, but it's, it's, it's pretty light. It's pretty trite. Mm -hmm. And Kenny and I actually, I, I put it away a couple of times because Ken Greer, when we were working together, said, no, you can't do that song. That's that's too commercial for us. It's too too frivolous. Anyways, I went up to the studio that morning and I was feeling really torn and, and upset about what I had seen in Africa and trying to come to terms with a lot of it. A lot of the, um, you know, some of the, some of the really tough things I had seen. And, um, I sat down. I, 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 it was like a pep pep talk to myself. And this gets back to the analytical, yeah, 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 therapy of music. And I wrote that song within ten minutes. And those, I had a good microphone. I had a good preamp. I had these digital recorders. Uh, yeah, folks, digital even existed back there in the late eighties. And then we were. I was always on the cutting edge of that stuff. But so I had my digital recorder. So this was studio quality stuff, really good converters and that. And, and I recorded with my little 414, AKG 414 microphone and Summit preamp. And um, the first verse is exactly what I sung at three o'clock in the morning when I went out to my little shed. Mm -hmm. My little, I used to call it the shed, uh, my studio attached to the house in, in Oakville. And I, um, I wrote that verse and I wrote the chorus and, uh, then I finished the rest up um, in the studio, but I had all the lyrics fleshed out that night. So a lot of what you hear in that record, the vocal, it was recorded in that little shed uh, wow. that fateful evening. And I felt better about things. It was like a pep talk to myself. And then it became a pep talk for millions of other people. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the original idea, I've done, you know, oh boy, I can't even, I've lost count of the number of trips I've done to Asia and Africa for NGOs, for non-government organization, uh, charity groups, but mainly World Vision. Uh, most of those trips actually exclusively World Vision. And, you know, I I, I get more out of those things than I put back they, they, because it charges my batteries. It, it makes me feel like um, I'm putting a little bit back in and doing something worth, worthwhile to help make the world a better place, help them. They do the heavy lifting and, and help them um, facilitate because it's very lending my name to it and doing those trips uh, so that I could see exactly what's going on and reflect properly on it. Um, again, you know, it's a big privilege. So I look at it as, as I get more out of it than I put back in because it recharges my batteries and it makes me feel worthwhile about who I am as a human being. So that's as simple as I can put yeah, it. Yeah, it's 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 humbling, and actually, I'm very taken. Yeah, on, 
taken aback um, by what you were saying, because um, as well, I'm very interested in uh, world politics. And as we know, in the last, say, 20 years, maybe a little bit more, things have gone really downhill in journalism. You don't have too many boots on the ground biased journalists anymore. You have quite a bit of um, government influence journalism. So um, right. I totally understand what you're saying there. And, yeah, and, and we and I think it's important that we have journalists that people trust, and yeah. that's that's a, been very much eroded over the years because people assume that the journalists have um, ulterior motives, you know, and and uh, uh, they they have um, allegiances to to uh, to one side of the politics or other, and mm -hmm. uh, the more you can remove that sort of thing, the better. From yeah, from and that's where independent media is really big now for that reason uh and you were actually alluding to how you came back with almost um uh post-traumatic stress disorder um same and I, i'm very confident i'll say 100 out of 100 you are very familiar with romeo dallaire yes and he came back and he wrote um shake hands with the devil and he wow. had a very um it was very public um breakdown a meltdown where he couldn't help the people in Rwanda where he was serving so um it's really a testament to you Tom I'm very impressed with um your 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 background and knowledge of um these issues for sure yeah I went to Rwanda quite a bit after Romeo was there uh, it was actually a 10-year anniversary and we saw a lot of these people in pink shirts uh in villages and being in front of uh their 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 village uh families and friends and that who were sitting down and they were actually reviewing them these guys had been in prison for war crimes mm -hmm. and they were trying to decide whether to let them back into society um, um i even though again it's well after the event the stuff that we saw and the stuff that i experienced there um no human being should should have to go through what what uh the rwandans did um it was the uh, you know uh, between the tutsis and the hutus and um these were actually two peoples that were created by colonists you know right, by the right. belgians and the, the french, french and belgium uh, they created them to create these this two different classes and the two different classes came to blows with each other um the Tutsu, Tutsis were, were you know, like it was just, you know, not to get into it in too much detail. Coming back from there, yeah, I had a breakdown with, uh, I was on CTV and and uh, I just, you know, I, I was hyperventilating. I couldn't speak, you know. Um, it was just such a powerful experience going there and, and being at that church in Nyamata and seeing thousands upon thousands of little skulls mm -hmm. in the, uh, catacombs that, that were slaughtered in that church and stuff it was a it was just a um frightening experience um yeah but yeah it's it it, it, it it's overwhelming just just the inhumanity to man that still go, takes place in the world and uh, we have to try to diffuse that with 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 positive energy and hopefully in some small way that you know uh the songs help out the the, the 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 concern of the West, but we have become a very jaded society as well, where we are oh, yeah. very insular and we're we're really only concerned with our own needs. Unfortunate reality of that is that um, this other stuff comes back to haunt you, you know. So it's uh, you know when I was in um, the camps in 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 Lebanon, the Syrian camps, um, those people were all middle class people from Damascus, a lot of them, and, and, yep. and now we're refugees and tents, and um, some of them are professionals. They were, and, and they didn't want to come to Canada or anywhere else. They want to go home. Mm -hmm. So part of going home is having a more stable world where people, um, you know, people can live at home and they can live in peace at home and they don't necessarily have to, to, to uh, immigrate, you know? Right, that's right. important uh, and it's important we you know as, as westerners no matter how tough things get over here we're, we're still pretty privileged you know so it's it's good to be able to help out here and there yeah we are we are definitely um <clears throat> privileged here in the west and uh 
Yeah, it's it's that old uh, saying about history repeats itself if uh, we don't remember it. And yeah. Anyways, let's move on to something a little bit more bright. I found out something that I didn't realize about you, and I'm pretty sure that um, this is one of your pastimes that you're a pilot. How long have you had your pilot's license, Don? Yeah, when I was an honorary colonel in the 409. So actually, the last time I was actually behind some controls was in in, in a jet plane, jet fighter, but because um, I was an honorary colonel for six years. Now, it wasn't on my own. I was in dual, so I was behind the the uh, the captain of the plane, the, the, the three flights I had. But, yeah, I flew for quite a while. I had a float plane, so I used to fly back and forth. From, and I know you got a good museum up there in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Start out to the bush plane. Yeah, so my dad started as a bush pilot, so it's in. I come by it honestly; it's in my blood. Um, so I was, I, I had a float plane for the better part of about eleven years. Wow, are you still flying? No, I'm not flying these days. I think after over twelve hundred hours, it starts to become a little bit like work, you know. But oh, really? Uh, okay. Be it, I would still enjoy it, but it was, it was a lot of work prepping the airplane, getting it ready. Um. You know, it's it's a very romantic ideal uh, to be a, a, a float plane pilot. But uh, anytime I would land on a lake, you know, because you only have uh, line of sight radio, um, right. uh, you're always concerned that that airplane starts up again, that you don't have an accident on that lake or whatever, and you're not stuck there because you, you get, in, get back into some pretty remote areas. So you're always a professional about it. You know, that's the thing about it. The, the kind of training we get in Canada as pilots, uh, even the private pilots, not, not, not even necessarily commercial pilots, is that the whole approach is a very professional approach and you pro approach it with a high degree of serious uh, serious focus. Yeah, it, it tends to take away from the enjoyment if you're prepping for two days before, correct? And Yeah, I mean, you know, that's why a lot of guys that have their license end up having a pilot anyways, uh, uh, you know, because then they can relax a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so you're starting, well, on the 30th, you've got a show um, in Niagara Falls, and then you have, what, about 15 or 17 more throughout November? Yeah, I got a bunch in November that are duo shows, strictly acoustic guitar with Bill and I. Okay, so tell the uh, the uh, fans um, that are going to go out and see those shows, and I'll put a list underneath the description box of here of your upcoming shows. Tom, tell the uh, people going to the show what they can expect. Um, how much Tom Cocker and Red Rider music will be in there? How much solo? And if you're doing anything else, if there's going to be a few um, surprises in there? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, there'll probably be guests coming out. Uh, I know Suzanne will be playing cello on a few shows, uh, and you know, it's it's just, we're going to regale people with stories and and pull out songs from some deep tracks that we don't tend to play all the time that all of a sudden take on a life of their own when you play them acoustically. Nobody's ever been disappointed with acoustic show that I do. It's just it's just a remarkable fun thing to do and the, the the strange thing about it is we go a lot longer than we usually go with a band um we have more freedom than we usually mm -hmm. have with a band because billy and i yeah we're almost clairvoyant there's almost like a uh psychic connection that we have and and the way we play off each other and 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 you know augment each other's playing with our instruments and and, and my singing and bill follows me so well so it's it's just it's always fun, and it's always like a real, uh, a real different thing than doing the show. Even though usually in the middle of the show I do one, two, or three acoustics as well. But um, so it's that sort of thing, but on steroids. You know, very nice, very nice. Be a lot of um, story. <laughs> okay, I won't uh, keep you much longer here. I know you've got a few other um, chats to do. Um, what is the opposite of unsubscribe, Tom? Uh, canceling your subscription, I guess. No. Right. See, see, that's the thing. I get everybody. It's <laughs> just the easiest answer. What's the opposite of unsubscribing? Unsubscribe, subscribing. That's right. Everybody yeah. do is legendary uh, Canadian singer, songwriter, guitar player, poet, pilot. Tom Cochran says and subscribe to the channel for these great interviews. 
And uh, I'd like to thank you very much. And make sure you guys uh, check out Tom's shows coming up in November, as well as keep an eye out because there may be a new album coming out next year. Oh, there will be. Yeah. Just awesome. a question. Man. Perfect. All, All right. right. Thanks again, Tom. Thanks, Ernest. You take care, buddy. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at one of these shows. We will.